this too. I'm not sure we're going to get through everything today, but anyway. Maybe not. I, I built the lesson plan to have next week is a, is a lighter week. We're just going to look at one of the Beatitudes. Uh, and so if I carry over, that was kind of my buffer. Wait, at what point do I kind of catch up? So I was, I've kind of built that in. Let me get all set here. I don't need to do that. Can I take a picture of your Bible? Just a page. Yeah. Nan thinks she writes a little. Oh, there's sure that you can too. <laughs> let me give you. Let me give you. Nan didn't make any difference. Yeah, forgot. Forgot that page. Get rid of that. <laughs> Thank you. See what she's talking about? My wife gets on to me because I write so little she can't read. Golly. Well, I, I, I mimic the size of the letters in the Bible. They're little, so I think no, that's what I do. All right. It's you. <laughs> Let's do this. We're going to talk about mercy today. And... Uh, the question is, if you take your glasses off, can you read that? I can't read that. If I take my glasses off, I'm in deep trouble. <laughs> There's no way. And I have at times gotten sick. What did I mean there? I can't. So I have to get a magnifying glass out to see. <laughs> yeah. But I, oh well, that's just what. Billy, you'll like this, but this is. We're talking about mercy today. Oh, well, when we get into it, I want to read that prodigal son. Like <laughs> long time. No, it's not prodigal son. I don't it's about with that, uh, two hunters. Okay. The day of the big dove hunt was coming up to a close. The hunters gathered their supplies in a cornfield, feeling the day had been a complete waste. Every bird that that flew overhead was well out of range. A few impatient uh, hunters shot at the birds anyway, but to no avail. As the sun began to set, two hunters marched by a small pond surrounded by tall grass. One of the hunters peered into the grass and saw, to his amazement, a flock of ducks uh -huh. leisurely floating on a peaceful surface of the pond. Unseen by the, uh, unseen by the ducks, the hunter smiled with pleasure. The hunter smiled with pleasure. Finally, a chance to get a good shot at something that's not moving, he said to himself as he raised his gun and peered into the sight. Finding a large duck in the crosshairs of his gun, the hunter's sweaty finger felt the trigger. But at the last second, he changed his mind, lifted his gun, and fired into the empty sky. The ducks flapped in their wings and made a rapid escape to the eastern sky. Ha! You can't even hit a sitting duck, joked the other hunter. The hunter who fired his gun looked at the friend in the eye and said, No, I can't hit a sitting duck. I'm a better hunter than that. I, it, it resonated with me because well, it's illegal to shoot a duck now. It, it, is, it is, and the whole idea is you're supposed to give them a fighting chance by letting them. Mm -hmm. I shot a quail one time. I was quail hunting up in Iowa. I wasn't having much luck, and I was on my way home crossing this cornfield because it was a country town. And Should be lots of quail around cornfield. Well, there was, but I, I'm not a good hunter. <laughs> really, but in that little town, the country roads here, the towns right here, and cornfields right here. It's just you know, it's just the way it is. You go from the cornfield to the town. I was almost back home, and all of a sudden, right in front of me was there's a quail. It's sitting on the fence, mm -hmm. to the whole wire fence, and that quail sitting on that strand of that whole wire fence right there. So I took this 12 gauge shotgun with this Ooh. quail shot in it, and I shot that quail. Yeah. All I found was a couple of feathers. <laughs> that that quail, I mean, it just it just disintegrated that quail. There was nothing left. All right. Well, I, that poor quail had no chance at all. Mm -hmm. No chance. Now, if I'd been a good hunter, I'd have spooked him. He'd have flown, and I wouldn't have hit wouldn't have hit him. That's what I've been doing all day. But that story reminded me of that. What was mercy? At the last second, he lifts the gun. He's a better hunter than he not being able to hit a sitting duck. 
in my case, should not have shot a sitting quail. But we'll look at this today and and kind of do a little bit of a, a little bit of a deep dive into what. Did you ever rode it on? Yes, sir. Front fender of a car, hunt rabbits. I've I've done rabbit hunting that way. I've done pheasant hunting that way. Yeah, back when I was a kid, I had an old '47 Chevrolet. It had the headlights on my front fender. Yep. Yeah. He sat on that straddle that headlight, man, and you had a perfect sleep there. And you had light coming between your legs, yep. you know, sleep by. Yep. We'd go out about 12 o'clock at night and get a lot of rabbits. You get rabbits that way, and if you're hunting for katydids or, or uh, grasshoppers or something in the, in the hay fields, you can do that at night. What do you do with them? I'll go fishing. Oh, using them for bait? Use them for bait. And so we just drive down there and set a straddle that headlight on that on that '57 Chevy pickup. You know, you sit right up there on the fender. Yeah. Take your net and you just catch them right and left. Didn't take them. All right. Okay, we 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 did did something. Okay, first four beatitudes. Let's look at them. Fifth chapter of Matthew. I'm gonna put that back in there. Okay, fifth chapter of Matthew. Let's look at them real quick and bring us up to speed. He's going to talk about Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's one. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's two. Blessed are the gentle, or meek, or uh, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now, those, those four, as a group, represent the, the conditions that we bring to Christ to be saved. Once you're saved, those conditions are met and, and blessings are bestowed. Then you come to this fifth one. And I put up here that they're the outward manifestations of, of those attitudes of, of how we see ourselves before God. Uh, poor in spirit, those who mourn, the, the meek, uh, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those are the attitudes that we need to have to present ourselves before God because they, they reflect how we see ourselves as needing God. And then the last four then become the uh, outward manifestations of those attitudes. Once we have those attitudes and God reacts to those attitudes by salvation, then we have how do you apply those attitudes? And as we look at scripture, application is always something that we've got to be concerned with. It's not just what does it mean but how do we apply what it means? So, in verse, verses uh, 7 and 8, then we're going to start looking at application. So the concept of mercy is, um, is looking at it as, a, as a, a gift of God on behalf of, of, of sinners. It's something that we don't earn. It's a gift that he gives us. And then I highlight that last bullet. The Lord requires his people to follow his example by extending mercy to others, that's how we act out. One of the ways we act out what we have received from God based on the condition of our heart in the first four. So, so we want to look at those in, in that way. As we look at then the, at the next one, what does it mean to, what's the meaning of mercy? Uh, I've given you some passages of scripture to look at. We won't go through all of those, but I, I noted them in there so that if you go back and you'll go back and read those passages of Scripture, you'll see how they how they relate to this. Mercy was not a characteristic displayed by Jewish culture at the time of Jesus. When you look at what Matthew 5, 43, and we'll get to that in the next six-week session when we start studying the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, that passage is going to be covered in there. And basically, it's Jesus just coming down on the Pharisees and the scribes and the, and the priests on their attitude of, of you, set, 
you set standards that people can't attain. You you can't. It was it was just too strict. They didn't care. Uh, you mentioned the the uh, prodigal son. The, uh, uh, appropriate is not no an appropriate story to go with this is to look at mercy in the <clears throat> in the story of the good Samaritan. Okay, the guys beside the road. Yeah, now that there, I agree with that. That's, yeah. and, and so what Jesus is telling them then, you scribes and Pharisees, in the culture he's talking about, you pass by somebody in need. Yeah, and they, and they should have been several of other people stopped. Exactly, exactly. So that's part of what this was. It was their culture not to help. It, it was in their mindset not to help. And that was completely against what God did for them. Completely against. They were in Exodus, in our readings in Exodus. The people that God takes into his covenant relationship in Exodus were crying out for help. They, The, the Egyptians had stomped on them. They were totally suppressed. And they were crying out for mercy. And God took them out of Egypt through Moses' leadership. Took them out of Egypt. Yeah. He displayed mercy when they didn't deserve it. He displayed mercy when they cried out. He displayed he he God displayed mercy when they had no way to to do it themselves. In turn, hundreds of years later, when people needed help and they had the capacity to help, they wouldn't. They wouldn't listen to somebody else crying out. It's basically the, the system. And so Jesus comes, and he says, look at you. You're wrong. You're wrong in what you're doing. So that's what that Matthew 5, 43, 7 teaches. Uh, if people see us to uh, care, they will They will care. That's, that's God's concept. If people see us care, then they will then they will care. What 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 we display in Christ's attitude is what people will see. So it's an action kind of thing. Uh, and of course, to the Romans, everybody's got the, you, you know the old the old thing in the Roman movies and stuff. You see the gladiators fighting. Are you going to kill him? You got him by the throat. You got to throw a sword right down on his throat. Okay, uh, the the prince or the Caesar or whomever sitting up there and yeah, you can let him live or no, you can kill him. And, and that's the kind of mindset you want to see. The Romans thought this was perfectly acceptable. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and to kill somebody that needs mercy, you didn't have any repercussions to that. And I put in there... Uh, it, it, the Roman culture gave the father of a child, a newborn, the right to decide if that child lived or died. A father could say that child is is uh, born without a leg. Kill it. And there was no repercussion to that. That child is defective. That child is a girl, not a boy. And I want a son. You can kill the child. Oh. That, that, that was a, it was a cruel, cruel thing. The same way to an owner of a slave. The slave owner could say, that slave's worthless to me. Kill yeah, him. Hitler was the same way. Sure. You know, sure. Kill him. Kill him. And there's no repercussion. There's no law that's going to come back and put you in jail for it. There's nothing. I have the right to decide whether you live or die. So here... Where does mercy play in that? Well, God, through Christ, comes in and brings this attitude of mercy. And this is part of what this is all about. We're going to see this when we get into the rest of the, of the uh, Sermon on the Mount, how Jesus takes their attitude towards specific situations. He says, this is where you're wrong. But he sets the stage in the Beatitudes. And here he says that ultimately the outcome of his mercy was the cross. And, and so Christ comes and he displays 
total subjection. They, they display their total lack of mercy. And he, he displays his total submission. And we are to be Christ-like. We are, we are to submit. So let's look at, let's look at this 5-7. Uh, the fifth beatitude teaches mercy to men and it, that, that only comes from God. The word mercy, merciful, comes from that Greek word, elam, or the Hebrew word, hesed. In the Old Testament, you, you see mercy a lot. If you go to your front of your Bible and look up uh, the encyclopedia type things where it says you look up mercy and see how many references there are to, to the word mercy. In the Old Testament, the word they're translating is hesed. That's, that's, that's Hebrew. In the New Testament, they're translating elam. That's the, that's the Greek word for mercy. So it's the two words, different languages translated Old and New Testament. But when we get that, I didn't, we're not going to take the time to look up uh, Hebrews 2.17. But, but Jesus talks about that in, in the book of Hebrews. The writing describes the high priest, the attitude of the high priest. The high priest was to go into the temple and go before the judgment seat when he went in on the Day of Atonement and took the shed blood of the, the perfect lamb in, the, in, in what God designed for the sacrificial system in Exodus, the high priest was to go in and go before the judgment seat. It was actually called the, the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was God would react to showing mercy on the people by the, by the giving of this blood before Christ that the people have atoned for their sins and God would forgive their sins and that's an act of mercy. They didn't deserve mercy. He grants mercy. And so that's what the high priest was supposed to have an attitude of mercy. So when God forgives the people based on what the high priest takes in there, that's what the priest should have been demonstrating to the people. And the priest and the Sadducees and the Pharisees should have been demonstrating peace toward the people. Instead, they bound the people's hands by saying, you got to do this, and you got to do this, and if you don't do this, you have to pay that, and if you got to do this, you got And there was a lot of law and a lot of judgment, but there was no mercy. And yet, God had given mercy to them, and he was expecting them to give mercy to the people. And they weren't doing that. So I, I put in there something that I think uh, uh, I highlighted it here. It's compassion in action. Lots of times we see uh, Christians tend to be, we tend to be uh, judgmental and we tend to be black and white. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. When in fact, all of us struggle with trying to do right. All of us struggle to, to some degree and some different things. We're to have compassion on those around us. Lost or saved, we're to have compassion. And it's the genuine compassion is expressed, is expressed in genuine help. In other words, you actually do something about it. Uh, the best example I can think of is how many times does somebody come up to you and say, oh man, I'm, you know, I'm sick or something, or I send out a prayer list and I say, you know, please pray for these folks. Now, I'm, that's me just letting you know there's a need for prayer. But how many times does somebody come up to you and our response is, well, I'll pray for you. And then I don't. What have I really said? I've said a lie, first of all. And I've, yeah. said, I've said something that I hope it should be encouraging to you if I say, Billy, I'm going to pray for you. You should, you should expect me to, to go to God and lift your name up there and your condition or your situation to God as a supporter of you. 
as an encourager of you. And you can feel comfortable that other people are concerned about me. That's, that's the idea that we all do it. But how many times do we say, maybe I'm the only one, yeah, I'll pray for you. And then, oh, I forgot to pray. Yeah, he writes all that down in the book when people call her and ask for prayer. He writes their name down. He do. And who they want prayer for. Lots of times, uh, lots of times I'll have to say, well, book. Well, uh, let me go get my pad, or let, I don't have a note. Do the book. same thing. Huh? I, keep, I keep paper by, the, by every phone. <laughs> yeah. Except now that I got this cell phone, catch me at the garage or catch me out in the barn or something, I don't have it. Lots of times, if it's a genuine, hey, you know, uncle's in the hospital or whatever, I stop, I'll let, let me go to the house and get a pencil and piece of paper and write that down. Because if I don't write it down, I'll forget it. it yeah. Be intentional. So people that ask, my thing, you know, ask for prayer and you don't do it, you're worse off than they are for not doing it. You're certainly, you're certainly worse off if you don't do it. But you're really worse off if you say you will and you don't. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. It's just, just saying you're going to do it and then don't do it. You know, if I get And then they'll say, oh, well, I forgot. Yeah, well, that's just an excuse. That's like that prayer thing you ain't never got going. There's some of those women that don't follow through. No. And a guy goes around calling, double checking those next to them after that person to see if they did it or not. Well, God knows whether Janie does. If Janie gets him to tell her or not, God knows. Yeah, that's God correct. knows. And so, so mercy is, I put it on here, mercy is meeting people's needs, not just feeling, but showing compassion. I don't, I don't feel compassion. I'm actually going to do something about the compassion. So what are needs? Uh, is it a helping hand? Is it giving? Is it comforting? Is it loving? Is it forgiving? Regardless of how that compassion is demonstrated, the fact that it's got to be demonstrated. It's got. To, it's an action. There's a, there's an action associated with it. So let's go on. Let's look at mercy in in uh, in relationship to forgiveness. There the, the two things are, are are tied together. We're going to look at several of those characteristics that mercy is tied with. And one of them is, is forgiveness, but it is different. In Titus 3 5, and we studied that when we studied Titus not long ago, uh, God's forgiveness of our sins flows from his mercy. Forgiveness is a, is a subset of mercy. You do a lot of things to show mercy. Forgiveness is one. Forgiveness isn't always the only, it, it doesn't have to always be given to show mercy. If if uh, if you say you're going to pray for somebody, or if you take food over to someone, or if you give somebody five bucks on a corner, whatever it, whatever your your situation is, doesn't always attach forgiveness to it. They haven't done anything wrong. They just need help. Back to the good Samaritan. He didn't do anything wrong. He just needed help. Mercy didn't have forgiveness attached to it there. Other times, I go before God, and I've sinned. I need forgiveness. He shows his mercy on me by forgiving the sin. Everyone else, we're saved. We come before God. I need to repent. It's, it's mercy. It's, for, excuse me, it's forgiveness flowing from his mercy toward us that allows us to have forgiveness of sin. So, so the two things are together, and, uh, and one flows from the other. So if you were putting those things in line, uh, the next one shows forgiveness uh, flows out of mercy, but mercy flows out of love. And this is all going to come together here in just a minute. But the fact is, okay, i gotta, I got to draft this out thing out. Up here is love. God loves an, an agape love. He loves at a level that I can't even think about. Nobody else can either. No. And, and from that love flows his desire to have mercy on us. That's his choice. Yeah. Out, of, out of love. He acts out of love and then comes mercy. And out of mercy can come forgiveness. Now, other things come out of mercy. But one of those things is forgiveness. 
So it's flowing out of mercy. Mercy is, is several things come out of love. Mercy is one of them. And so love is up here. I can't attain that level of love. That's God's love. So let's look. Let's look at this at this uh, next one. How does I like this, Rob? I think you got this thing going. This is all right. <laughs> you notice I haven't thrown the remote or anything. Yeah. Mercy's closer related to grace, but it's different. So out of love flows mercy. Out of love flows grace. Grace is different than mercy. And uh, and so this one, mercy offers relief from the punishment. Grace offers pardon for the crime. If I commit a crime, I'm pardoned under God. I should... What, what's, what's sin? Sin says death, separation from God. Spiritual death. But under God's grace, I'm pardoned for that sin. Not for all, though. Well, no, well by, by his law, I believe. Yeah. But mercy is I'm relieved of the punishment of that sin. I get, I get a traffic ticket. And, and somebody comes up and pays my traffic ticket. I got I got mercy for somebody paying my traffic ticket, but I still got a ticket on my record. Mm -hmm. Okay, I get three tickets, I get in trouble. Okay, God's grace pardons that ticket, that sin that separates me from him. The punishment of sin is death. Mercy takes care of the punishment. Grace takes care of the condition. Pardons the condition. So, that, so that's how they're they're related. And you see where it comes from. Again, the Good Samaritan. Mercy bound his wounds. If if going if walking beside him and you see the guy laying there and he's and he's bleeding, and he's conked out and stuff, and you put some ice on his forehead, and a compression on his wounds, and he stops the bleeding, and you wind him, bound him up, and then you went on, you've shown mercy to the individual, but he's still sitting beside the road, and he's got a long road ahead of him. Yeah. He's, he's he was, you know, he can't heal himself. But what did the guy do? He takes him and puts him on his donkey, he takes him to the next town. He finds a place for him to stay. He he gets him settled in. He pays the, the innkeeper money to have somebody tend his wounds until he recovers. So, so what happened is grace, it didn't just relieve the bound the wounds and, and relieve the suffering. Grace provided for the healing. So grace, again, where did these things come from? These things come from God. They, they come down out of his love. One takes care of the condition, and one takes care of the future. One heals the bleeding. One heals the body as a whole, so it, there, there's not even reason to have to heal the bleeding anymore. The skin's covered over. The condition is healed. So that's, that's a way to look at this thing. So when we talk about Blessed are the merciful. You're seeing, you're seeing out of this a demonstration of blessed are those who deal with the physical need. Now the question is going to come: Is we are we going to deal with the spiritual need? Now God does the forgiving, God does the grace giving, God does the saving, but are we concerned about? the wounded spiritually beside the road that we would stop and share the gospel with. That takes care of the bleeding. God, through his mercy, his grace, his judgment, is going to take care of the future, the healing. What heals that? So 
So you see how this, this all kind of comes together. Uh, mercy and justice come up. Uh, sin deserves death. We talked about that. Christ paid the price. Mercy is bestowed on the believer. But yet, when the mercy is bestowed upon the believer, God demands obedience. And so, that means there's a continuous action for the recipient of that. God's commanding me to share the gospel. I saved you. I stopped the bleeding. I healed you. I took away the I took away the punishment and I pardoned the sin. Now you go do the same. That's reflecting the character of God that we now have living within us. So when our bodies become the temple of Christ, uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit to abide in us, we have that capacity within us through the power of God to share that forward. So that's that's where that's headed. So, so the source of all of this will be the next one. It's 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 a pure pure mercy is a pure, is a gift of God, and it comes with the with salvation with the new birth. So so what do the first four do? Those reflect humility, repentance, surrender, pure heart, the holiness. Now we come to this thing, and we're going to see there are some absolutes and and relative attributes. Well, what's an absolute? An absolute is Love, truth, holiness. That belongs to God. God God creates a level of love that man cannot attain. God creates a level of truth that man cannot attain. God is a level of holiness that man cannot attain. So those things come from God. So what God has he shares with us in these attributes that flow from love, truth, and holiness. He sh those things flow from him. What are they? The, the, the mercy and the justice and the grace and all of those kinds of things. Those are the things that flow from him and abide in us. He gives us those that we might share those so that others can receive holiness and love and truth from God that they can share, they can go out and share. So you come down to this, it all comes, it's, it becomes an action of love. God's the source. God's the source of truth. God's the source of love. God's the source of holiness. And we're to share that by demonstrating our love, our mercy, our grace on others. That means a whole lot of things. That can be applied to just about every phase of our life, every day of our life. So, we're, we're blessed. What it says, we're happy. We're happy. The word blessed means happy. When we are merciful to others. And we're to create that kind of, a, of an attitude. So, How do we practice this? We practice it through physical acts, things that we do. Stop and bind the wounds of the one that's beside the road that needs help. How many times have we seen it? I don't care. I, I just This is just an example of not pointing fingers toward me. Went to visit, uh, I think I shared it with you here just not long ago, uh, Louise Wallace. She, just before she passed away, went over and visited with her and had prayer with her, and, and she was not, anyway, just visit. But coming back, coming back, I'm driving back this way, there's these two women parked off the side of the road, and, and one of them is kind of out in the road, kind of trying to wave somebody down. It was obvious they were needing help. car wasn't even completely all the way off the road. And people are just driving around and driving around and driving around. And, I, and it just, God wasn't going to let me drive by. Here's what? So I pulled off behind them and asked them if I could help them. Well, they did. They ran out of gas. Couldn't even get the car, pull them off the road, get out of gas. 
Long story short, there's a need. It could be met. There was a path that was available to share. And when it's over with, they're thanking me, but they're thanking God too. And I had the opportunity to say, we, Hillside Baptist Church, this is going to be the band-aid that's going to let you get down the road to the filling station down there, and you can get a tank of gas through the church. But i got to get you to the place down there before that. we got to get you a gallon or two that's going to get you down there. So there was a band-aid to put on the wound and a way to, a way to correct the problem for it. And they were very appreciative, and we got to praise God together through that. Uh, so so just, I, I put that out there just not to say what I did. That's not it at all. It's the idea that God puts the wounded man beside the road. Sometimes it's there so he can see what we're going to do. Yeah, when I come up on a situation like that, I weigh in what the people look like, what the car looks like, and if they look like hot head and bones, I don't help them. All I can say, Billy, is I, I know what you mean. <laughs> I drove by, I drove by, I come up on a car going down the Indian Nation Turnpike one night. Well, that's a bad place to get stuck. And and there was a, a young lady standing out with the hood up on her car, and I saw it in the headlights coming up. And, and come up on it, and I was going to pull in front of him and stop. I started to pull in front of him, and I saw some guy duck his head up on the other side of the car. Yes. Just, I just kept on going. There you go. Now, whether or not that was the right thing to do, I don't know. Safe thing to do. Well, it's, it's safe for way. me, but do I believe God's going to protect me? I, I have, it no. has bothered me. Well, it is your brain to use. And that's, that, that all may be true. Other side of Calvin one day, there's a woman walking down the road with a small child. That'd be I stopped. I might help. There was a car back up there. I passed it, and there was nobody in it or anything. And I stopped. And I could tell they were fearful of even kind of approaching my car. Strange guy stopping in a car. Nobody else in the car with him. This lady gets in the car with a strange guy with a kid. You know, there was a lot of anxiety on her part. But I took her to the next town, Stewart down there, and took her to the filling station where she needed to go so she could call her kin folks to come get her. It goes both ways. It goes what? You know, yeah. if you're out there, how, how bad are you? If you're walking alongside the road and you want somebody to stop, they can come out and Put to your whatever. The point is, we have to be listening to, to God. God, what do you want me to do? Here's the situation. What do you want me to do? And if he's and if he tells you, <coughs> you better stop. There's a reason he put the man at the side of the road. It, we, we just have to be because it gives us the opportunity to. To show mercy. It gives us the opportunity to see, let others see Christ in us. I, there, we can have lots of examples, but that, but the point is, yes, are, are there risks? You're you absolutely right. Believe. There are. Especially when, like you said, you saw the man duck down in the car. Sure. That's, that's bad. That's there. That's a bad deal. It's, it, it, it had all the earmarks of, oops, but I've never forgotten that. I've passed by lots of people off the side of the road. And I, I, I don't even I know I have, but I don't remember. But there are some that just stick in my mind that should I should I have stopped? Should I have done something? Other times it hasn't bothered me a bit. I Sean and I were driving back with my son and he was a little bitty type. Back street of car, there's a lady walking right down the middle of the road. Coming up to, off of the interstate down McLeod Road before it was four lane. She's walking right down and stops and she's crying and some guy kicked her out of the car and all that kind of stuff. Come in. So we put her in the car, 
She's sitting back there, and I look back on her, and I said, what kind of a fool am I? I had a, a complete stranger sitting in the back seat with my son. You know, we're in the front seat. We drive to the police station, and I let her get her out, and get her in the police station, and they can take care of her. They, they can get her home and all that kind of stuff. But she's standing right in the middle of the road. Another time I come out of Shawnee, and there's a guy laying in the middle of the road. <laughs> he had a, I don't know, it's a heart attack or what, but he had to call the cops and had to call the ambulance and stuff. When do you stop when you're not? It's not all about just cars. What about the people, our neighbors? What about each other in here? What about the, the folks that we know? What about how... How do I act in a merciful, compassionate way toward them that they can see Christ in me? Not me. They can see Christ in me. That's what. That's a whole point of what this is. So, so mercy's got to be spiritual. Uh, mercy's mercy's got to be something that we do, that we act on. Now, why? Because the the thing says. Blessed are the merciful, happy are they, for they shall receive mercy. You just got to be careful, though, of who you give the mercy. Just like them people over at Shawnee, you see walking out in the middle of the road carrying a bucket, claiming they're collecting money for their church now. What kind of church does that? Not very many. Not very many. I, I'm, not not really, I'm not, not arguing with you, Billy, at, at all, but, I, but if there's a there's a discretion that has to be applied to that there are times when the, the scripture that I've got in here he said when did we not when did we not do this and God says when you haven't done it to the least of these you've done it to me and when you see a need and he guides you to that need we have to respond we, we have to that's what he did for us if if any part of me earned or I deserved God's love for me and his mercy on me, it would be because of me. But I didn't deserve any of it. I, I now know I was unworthy to even be looked at by God. So he displays a level of mercy, a level of grace, a level of love that he couldn't even look on me in eternity. I can't have sin and be in the presence of God in eternity. And he looks beyond that. And so I think uh, we have to look to those kind of things. We're to have an attitude to look like and project the likeness of Christ. And so that's that's mercy. What do you guys think? I, 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 we talked kind of through this pretty fast. I don't know if I want to start this. Let's look at this real quick. We may pick it up and, and do a little talking about it next week. But this one about blessed, the next one, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. I'm going to sum this up. Heart, that translates cardia, cardiac, that's where we get our word. It, God talks a lot about the heart. And when he's talking about the heart, he's not talking about this reddish organ inside my chest that bumps and pushes. It's, it's that part of our, of our consciousness that controls our will and controls our, our thinking. And he knows the heart. Okay? And so he knows what the inner person is doing or will do because he knows the heart. And then it talks about, like in Pharaoh, with the, with the 12 uh, or 10 uh, uh, right. yeah, that <coughs> he says he hardened Pharaoh's heart, or Pharaoh hardened his heart. Well, God knows that. And we're just as guilty of that as they were. And so he, he knows that, but he says pure. When he says, blessed are the pure in heart, who are the pure in heart? Well, pure means catharsis. Put that up there. And uh, I, think I, I think I went 
didn't know they were flying. I walked right by it, didn't I? Mm -hmm. the, the pure in heart are those that it talks about cleansing contamination. And so that begins to take us to uh, not having contamination within our heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. Well, how can I not have contamination? Well, when I'm when I'm uh, uh, single-minded, or I I I I, I got to have undivided attention. I've got to have spirit, spiritual integrity. Those are that's a heart that's not contaminated. My heart's contaminated because I'm I'm divided on how I look for some things. <laughs> I'm I'm divided about my devotion to some things. I kind of like me, 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 me. I want my red convertible, you know. Well, <laughs> if anything that divides my attention from God is a is a contaminant. Now, we all have contaminants in our house. We all have contaminants in our fuel for our cars. If it's enough, it destroys the function. Yep. You get you get enough contaminants and a fuel for your car, it's not going to run. Right. But it's not purely refined, is it? No. It's not pure. No, they don't say it is either. No, <laughs> and they, they don't. But but the idea here is that we should have a purity in our heart toward God. And so blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now this thing about this thing about seeing God. It's not a head religion. It's not a hand religion. That's that's human. If it's a head religion, then I know. It's knowledge. I know because I've read. I, I know. Well, I know nothing. All right? But I think I do. So I can have creeds or I can go to school and take all kinds of lessons and stuff. And I know. So I therefore, I'm, I'm religious. No. The other is hand religion. That's that's where you do good deeds. All I do is just hand out money, and I go and I do all this kind of stuff. But those are just actions without heart. God's looking at the heart. He wants a heart religion. So He wants me to to be tuned in to getting rid of contaminants within my heart. Now He 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 He's the one that purifies that. Well, how does He purify it? Man, I'm running through these so fast. Don't get out of here in a hurry. How does he purify that? We must realize that we are unable to live, that's not life, it's live a single holy moment without the Lord's guidance. I'm not going to be holy. God's got to, it's got to be God working in me. We must stay in God's word. That's why you're here today. You're studying God's word. Essential to be controlled by and walking in the will and the way of the Spirit. There is a path. Jesus said that path is narrow. There's a path to living for Jesus, and it's narrow. There is a way that he wants us to go. So there's, he has a plan. We have to stick to his plan, not mine. And then the, the last, last part is we must pray. Now that pray is, now lay me down to sleep. That's not it. That's when we get on our hands and knees in the quietness of our of our house or a closet or a back room or a field or a barn or wherever, uh, and you just and you talk to God and you talk to God and you listen to God. That communication is is critical. Uh, I put a chart in here that you could look at. Uh, there are six kinds of purity, and you look at this, and there's. Primal is what God created. It's like there's light from sun. That's a pure light. Uh, that's a God-created thing. That's above me. There's what God created in the Garden of Eden when he said after, after six days, I finished my creation and it was good. And God said it was good. That's the kind of creation that God does. Then there's positional purity that comes when, when you're saved. At that point in time, you were in a position to be pure before God's eyes. So you go on down through those, you see how that gradually works its way down to things that you have ability to look at. So why do we want to be pure? That we can see God. And there's a whole lot of scripture that talks about seeing God. If you've been reading through Exodus, you talk about, let us see God, let us see God. 
And when you get down and really look at that, God doesn't say you can't see me. He says you can't see my face. God, allowed, God is seen by people. <coughs> uh, we look at John, looking at uh, in, in that first chapter of, uh, of Revelation. He feels a presence behind him. He turns and sees this. It's not an angel. It's the incarnate Christ back in heaven. He talks about Moses seeing God and him being an aura about him. Uh, others, Joshua, David asked to see God. Well, here he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? They shall see God. And that's a that really comes at the time of eternity. That comes for you and I. That comes at the time that, that we are in the presence of God. When we see him, there will be a purity. There will be no, no contamination in what we have in our hearts when we stand before God. So, I ran through that pretty fast, but, but that's the idea. As you can see, these things build on one another to take us to this point. And I've gone over about five minutes, but late getting started, so I just take it like that. <laughs> Let's have a quick word of prayer. Father, once again, we just uh, thank you, Lord, for this time together. We thank you, Father, for being able to to just uh, study your word that you've left it for us to be uh, to be studied. You've given it uh, us written access to it and the language access to it, Lord. So uh, just uh, we just lift it to you, Father, to to bless our lives and enrich our lives that we might be drawn closer to you. Be with us in this hour that we might truly uh, worship you. For it's in Christ's blessed name we pray. Amen. Amen.